For the last two and a half years where I've been uploading videos in this series, a running theme of the subjects has been internet access. Devices that could connect to the internet or something resembling it in an unexpected period has always fascinated me. In a previous video, I focused on the play cable for the Intellivision, which was released in 1980. The fact that you could download games to it over a phone line all those decades ago was astounding. So when I found out that the CBC game line was capable of something comparable only three years later, naturally, I had to delve in head first. In short, the game line was a modem adapter for the Atari 2600 that allowed users to play sessions of games over a telephone connection, aided, of course, by the use of a credit card. It barely lasted 9 months and the major publishers of the day wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot joystick, but the fact it was a technical marvel at the time and that its demise led to the forming of one of the biggest tech companies of the 90s, well and truly gives it the title of a wonder of the retro gaming world. The story of the game line starts with an entrepreneur named William von Meister. His previous project was an online service called The Source. Founded in 1978, it was a huge rival to CompuServe, which ultimately ended up purchasing and dismantling it in 1989. Rewinding a few years though, as he had exited well before then thanks to a $1 million settlement from a former investor, Von Meister had acquired technology for data transmission that he intended to use of cable. The venture was to be called Home Music Store, and the idea was a music playing service on cable that would be transmitted utilising satellites. Even though he had the support of Warner Bros, sadly, this idea was shut down before it even began. Audio retailers had found out about this plan through an expose in Billboard magazine and worried about their bottom line, went on a full defensive campaign discouraging Warner Bros and other record labels from participating while threatening a boycott if they did. Not discouraged by the fate of Home Music Store, Von Meister instead turned his attention to the burgeoning video game scene of the early 1980s. Forming a company called Control Video Corporation and securing financial backers from the likes of Citicorp and the developer publisher Magic, a $2 million R&D budget was set into motion, mostly spent towards making the modem as low cost but technically impressive as possible. The result, as Von Meister himself stated, was the cheapest auto dial 1200 board modem by a factor of 100. Initial production of 10,000 units started in the April of 1983, with a special promotion for the first customers being written about in the June issue of Electronics Games Magazine. The modem was called the Master Module. As well as rocking 8 kilobytes of RAM to store a bit of information, the 1200 board modem was capable of both pulse and tone dialing. It plugged into a 2600's cartridge slot much like any other game. Because of this, it was compatible with all forms of the 2600, but also oddities such as the Coleco Gemini and 2600 adapters for the ColecoVision and Intellivision. After it was slotted in, a 9 volt battery was required for operation, but apart from plugging it into the phone line socket, that was it as far as physically setting it up. The hardware cost was $59.95, but a one-time $15 membership fee was required to get online. Once the user had registered, in the mail they received a binder for storing game instructions, a poster, as well as a monthly subscription to an in-house magazine called GameLiner that they put a $24 worth on. There were plans of a further annual service fee of between $10 and $12, but as you'll soon find out, the game line didn't make it that far. But winding it back a bit, the game line connected to central service in Vienna, Virginia. It worked around the possibility of phone bill shock by only using toll-free 800 numbers, but even then, the phone line was only in use when it was downloading a session of a game, which only took a matter of seconds. Each member had a pin which they could use to log in, also meaning they could use their game line anywhere of a phone line, not just their own residence. From there, an on-screen keyboard was used to select games, as each had their own 3-digit code which were listed in GameLiner. Alternatively, the code 999 would show a list of the games free of charge. However, in the second issue of GameLiner, CVC warned that the service was at risk of being taken down because it was being abused. Supposedly, too many members were calling 999 and staying on it too long, and this was swamping the system, but most importantly, costing CVC money. I have no idea what the fate of 999 was, but it's hilarious to think that people were overstaying their welcome looking at a free of charge online list in 1983. The way the games were played weren't like any other service I've covered, but instead were offered as sessions. 
Think of how arcades used to operate. You could waltz up to any game, but inserting a coin into an arcade machine would only give you a single play, not access to the entire game unless you kept winning. GameLine followed a similar principle with each session costing a dollar, which was charged to a credit card. This was good for 5 to 10 plays depending on the game. An example given is that the dollar would be good for say, one play of chess, considering how long a game could go for, while a shoot 'em up would be good for 4 or 5 plays, since the action is a lot more fast paced and each play session much shorter. Fortunately, weekly spending limits could be set up for each pin, so mum and dad wouldn't have to worry about little Jimmy racking up a huge MasterCard bill. To encourage continuous playing, CVC added in some perks for returning customers. As well as receiving a free session after paying for five, members would also get free play on their birthdays. So what of these games? All were supplied by third party 2600 publishers, the biggest of which was The Magic, which also partly funded the project. Others included the gaming division of 20th Century Fox, US Games, and Data Age, but unfortunately for CVC, they never cracked the big publishers such as Activision or Atari themselves. I actually found a very interesting document on the internet archive from Mattel's internal documents about the game line. It includes a report about the device as well as correspondence with John Kerr, who was the vice president of CVC. Ultimately, they didn't go ahead with a partnership, but it was fascinating to read otherwise. All the games on GameLine were readily available to buy in retail if you wanted the game for keeps from the aforementioned publishers, except for one. Save the Whales was only ever on GameLine, it involved shooting and destroying harpoons and nets from a submarine to, well, as the title would suggest, Save the Whales. Developed by Steve Beck with plans to publish with 20th Century Fox, all proceeds from the game were intended for Greenpeace. There were two other games planned too. Dutch Elm Defender and Attack of the Baby Seals. Neither were ever programmed and Save the Whales never made it to market. It was thought to be lost for a few decades when two prototype cartridges were found in the possession of one Arnie Katz in early 2002, who was the co-founder of Electronics Game Magazine. The reason it only ever appeared on GameLine before its planned release in retail was another interesting reason for GameLine to exist. Save the Whales had been made available online first so the developers could gauge players' interest. Save the Whales probably isn't that great of an example since it was intended for charity, but overall, publishers could partake in very useful market research. They could receive stats like how many players were trying the games and how long they were playing for. Statistics like this on a grand scale were not very common in the 80s. One aspect of game line that was unique was the community CVC attempted to create around it. The apex of this was the Game Liner magazine. Each issue included detailed descriptions of new games added, hints, Q&As, interviews with developers, game listings, and even competitions. Grand prizes were promised for those, including items such as AV gear and computers, along with more outlandish claims of sports cars, four-year college scholarships, and even $100,000 worth of gold bullion. There were two contests a month that included three regional playoffs and one national championship per year. Split over 20 regions of the US, the highest score in each games were needed to win. An additional 50 cent fee was then required to submit the score. Ultimately, the only proof of any tangible prizes were listed in issue 2 of GameLiner. There were no gold or sports cars, but instead, the top 1% of rankings would win a GameLine branded jacket. Nice. Also shown in issue 2 was the GameLine hot air balloon named the High Score. This was used to hawk GameLine at CES, but was a big floating example of the cracks that were beginning to form. It was later pointed out that the single biggest transaction Von Meister ever managed for CVC was selling that balloon for $15,000, which was three times the amount he originally paid for it. Another worrying thing of note in issue 2 was the mail section. Here, the author of GameLiner actually encourages users to write to the presidents of Activision, Atari, Parker Brothers and Mattel, asking them to feature their games on the service. They even include the exact addresses to post the pleading letters to, which couldn't have left a great impression. It wasn't all downers though, as the future of GameLine was bright. Not only could members play the latest games, but future expansions of the service were continually promised. The future didn't actually turn out to be that bright as none came to fruition for GameLine specifically, but two services were seemingly close. Promised for the first quarter of 1984, Sportsline and Stockline would grant the GameLine capabilities beyond gaming. 
Stockline would list stock market index quotes as well as a portfolio feature, while Sportsline would show sports scores for both college and pro competitions. Also promised was Bankline for online banking and fund transfers, Newsline for text news stories, Opinionline which were forums, Infoline which would provide information such as classified ads, airline schedules and even horoscopes, and Mailline. Mailline was planned to allow you to send a message of up to 8,000 characters for only 15 cents. What a bargain. Ultimately, none of these services would ever see the light of day on the game line, as by early 1984, game line was as good as burnt toast. 1983 was not a good year for CVC to launch, as it was not a good year for any gaming company. The famous game crash of that year was already in full swing, and everyone was feeling the burn. Companies were going bankrupt left, right and centre, with even the big dogs feeling the squeeze. The thing is, with most of GameLine's publishing partners going bust, many of their games in cartridge form were popping up in bargain bins across the country for mere dollars. Why would a gamer spend a dollar for limited play when they could own the entire game for just a few more? GameLine did report healthy growth when it started. In October 1983, GameLine had 3,000 members with 50 new subscribers each month. Users averaged 20 plays per month, but by early 1984, things were much more dire. Gameline was a physical example. Only two full issues were ever published, those being for the months of September and October. There was never a November issue, but instead, there was an undated newsletter posted with the updated master menu sometime later called Gameliner Notes. Aside from sprucing new games and extra services that would never see daylight, they claimed that an extended holiday issue was delayed thanks to printing complications. Hmm. After that, Gameliner was never seen again. Nothing is heard from the company or Von Meister until April of 1984. It was pointed out that the game line was underperforming as retailers were afraid to stock it due to the downturn. It's also pointed out that for whatever reason, CVC never supplied any review copies to the press. Regardless, Steve Case, who was the director of marketing, remained optimistic. The optimism was short-lived, however, as by May, all master modules were recalled, signaling the end of the service. Von Meister blamed publishers, retailers, and the market crash for the untimely end, and as an extra kick in the guts, the master modules had to be disposed of in dumpsters as the cost to recycle them was outweighed by the transportation costs to get them recycled in the first place. The CVC still had a bit of steam left. They had hopes for a new service called Interlink that would operate on home computers instead. The service would instead consist of renting a modem for $14 per month and would feature many of the services that never made it to the game line. Things looked bright as CVC struck a partnership with the telephone provider South Bell that included a $5 million investment. Trials were planned for Atlanta, Houston, LA and DC, but sadly, the project was shut down when new government regulations disallowed companies such as South Bell to be information providers. Von Meister left CVC in early 1985. The remains of the company, now spearheaded by Steve Case and Jim Kimsey, went on to create a popular service for Commodore computers called Quantum Link They used many of the features that GameLine had and should have had. Later on, this evolved into a little company you may have heard of called America Online, otherwise known as AOL. Sadly, William von Meister passed away broken in relative obscurity from skin cancer in 1995. But reportedly, his funeral was full of high-profile executives, which surprised many who weren't aware of his past. Steve Case delivered a very moving eulogy, stating that, without Bill von Meister, there would have been no America online. Not just that, as he had his hand in many ventures over the decades, leaving his influence all over the industry. Gameline was one of many, but was definitely the product of a very forward thinker. As an aside, cable radio did eventually become very common, so suck it music retailers. Hello retro gamers, and thanks for watching. Links to sources and videos can be found in the description box.